Welcome to the Whistleblower Newsroom. I'm Christina Borgeson. Some people in this world are what I call super public servants. And I think my guest today falls in that category. Mick Harrison is a former math teacher who got a law degree and quickly became one of this nation's premier whistleblower lawyers. He joined the Government Accountability Project, the world's leading nonprofit whistleblower advocacy organization, even before he graduated summa cum laude from law school in the early 90s. Now he's an expert at the kind of David versus Goliath fights in which lawyers representing whistleblowers exposing major government and corporate malfeasance inevitably find themselves. As current litigation director for the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, a nonprofit dedicated to investigating and getting accountability for major 9-11 crimes that government investigators ignored, Mick is lead crafter of what could become the biggest, most important for Americans and the rest of the world, whistleblower cases in history. Full disclosure, I consider Mick a friend and we work together on the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. Welcome, Mick. Thank you. I want you to talk about some of your cases. And I noticed that the EPA is a big hot spot for you in your legal career. So I, I want you to talk about the case where you represented Richard Emery, who was head of the EPA's Criminal Enforcement Council. And he was a whistleblower. So talk about, talk about that case. Well, uh, Attorney Emery was actually the head of all the attorneys in EPA nationwide doing criminal enforcement for environmental laws. He was trying to do his job uh, correctly. He was receiving, and this was in the 1990, 1993 timeframe. He was, and this is when I started at the Government Accountability Project, uh, still in law school, actually, at that time. Um, and Mr. Emery had the courage to report a number of cases of political interference in environmental crime prosecutions by an entity you would not have contemplated would have been doing that political interference. And that was the Department of Justice itself. And wow. so he, he collected about, I don't know, 20 case examples of political interference from high levels in the Department of Justice, preventing, obstructing, or downplaying criminal prosecutions of environmental crimes. And he was getting these reports from US attorneys uh, and criminal enforcement officials and investigators around the country from the different regions. And at that time, there was an inquiry by Congress. Congressman John Dingell, who some may remember from those days, was uh, head of the, I believe it was the Government Oversight Committee. And he was looking into the allegations of political interference in environmental crime prosecutions. And he asked Mr. Emery to turn over his case files to Congress. And Mr. Emery dutifully did that, thinking one, it was his legal obligation, and two, it was his ethical obligation. And the day of or the day after he turned over those files to Congressman Dingell, he was reassigned into a do-nothing job. And told, That's a classic tactic. It is. And he was told uh, to have no, nothing further to do with the congressional inquiry. Now, Mr. Ermey wasn't inclined to be treated that way. And he came to the Government Accountability Project where I was working, most folks know, GAP, the Government Accountability Project, as the leading whistleblower protection organization, certainly in those days, I think was, has continued to be prominent in that regard. And GAP assigned the case to Richard Condit, my supervising attorney at the time, who I've continued to work with over the years. And I and um, jo Joanne Royce, who was our one of our colleagues there, and the three of us litigated that case for Mr. Emery. And he wanted to not have his, his career destroyed for doing the right thing. And we did litigate it aggressively. Um, we did issue a subpoena and notice of deposition to a high level DOJ person thought to be oh. involved. Oh. Well, the name is Barry Hartman. And uh, we didn't get to the bottom of that case. So I'm not making any particular allegation against Barry Hartman other than 
we thought he knew a lot about what was going on. And now, we wanted to talk, depose him. These, yeah. these um, files that, that um, Emery had, had gathered, um, could you give examples of the types of things, of incidents that were in those files? I can probably give you some general examples. That has been now 30 years ago. Yeah, I know. Time but, flies. You know, the Department of Justice has proven itself over and over again to be a little hotbed of uh, corruption. I mean, and ever greater corruption, it seems, <laughs> as we go along. That's why I'm interested in what these, uh, what yes. these cases. Yes, the forms of the interference were either instructing a U.S. attorney to not prosecute the case at all, or directing the U.S. attorney to turn a criminal case into a civil case where no one could go to jail, or reducing the penalties sought, either criminal or civil or, or dollar penalties, um, so that essentially either the wrongdoers would get a slap on the wrist or be facing no meaningful risk or would basically get off. But were these corporate wrongdoers? For the most part, yes. They were corporate wrongdoers. You know, it's so interesting because I have heard recently this term that's called uh, regulatory capture. Have you heard of that term? I'm afraid so. Could you talk about that term? Well, it means corporate influence with government agencies, corporations who are being regulated by the government agency being influenced so that the agency cannot do its job objectively in protecting the public interest, but ends up serving the corporate interest because of that influence. That's the short version. And I mean, one of the things that people are talking a lot about right now is regulatory capture of virtually all the key government agencies that regulate corporations and uh, that engage in um, uh, activities with the military. And of course, right now, in the in the days of uh, you know the pandemic, COVID, farm pharmaceutical, big pharma, and the vaccines, and so on, um, we're talking about FDA, CDC, and so on. Uh, is that your experience throughout your law career that regulatory capture was on the on the upswing and and what is your view right now am, am i am i describing the landscape uh am i being too hyperbolic or no. am i being accurate to, you tell me yeah well i think it's pretty accurate the corporate influence problem seemed to be peaking when i arrived at gap and at 1990 we created a um a program there richard condit and i called EPA Watch, which was just for environmental whistleblowers and to keep an eye on EPA for potential corporate influence. We found a lot of examples of it um, then. That was just after I think there was a scandal about who was it the EPA head who got actually charged with a crime and was forced to resign. I'm not gonna remember her name, but uh, it was a big issue then. Um, what kind of a crime do you remember? No, unfortunately, I don't. Okay. Okay. It may it may have been giving false testimony to Congress, but I've forgotten. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't want to give the name that's coming to my mind because it may be wrong. Okay. Uh, which wouldn't be good in this context. So, uh, but give, to give you an example, uh, what happened in Mr. Emery's case, even though we did settle his case, uh, and he was, you know, uh, very satisfied with the settlement because we achieved his objectives for in terms of his career. And I can't tell you the details of the settlement. I can tell you later he did receive a gold medal from EPA, which is the highest honor EPA bestows. Now, uh, now, however, shortly after that, because of a change in administrations, Congressman Dingell lost his subcommittee. The investigation into political interference and environmental crimes ceased. And the people who were responsible remained in DOJ and EPA. And uh, it was never made clear exa exactly the extent of that corruption or who all was involved. 
And who, who knows, there could be, even though that's 30 years, there might still be someone today. You know, I, you know, you, you, you said that after you had this experience, you started this EPA watch. And I, and I keep thinking to myself, why is it that somebody has to go through the effort and expense of creating an organization to keep an eye on an organization that is being paid with our tax dollars to, to, to protect us the way your organization now has to keep an eye on them so that they will do their job? Well, I, you know, uh, I, I'm no longer with GAP. I'm now with the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, as you may know. And it's another watchdog organization. And I've, in the interim, I've worked with other watchdog organizations, including on chemical weapons disposal regarding the army and so forth. And the answer to your question is that when there's huge amounts of money involved, as there are in major government contracts or in corporate projects that have government regulation, we haven't, we haven't evolved as a human race to the point where the humans involved in making all that profit can resist using their influence to allow them to continue to do the wrong thing because it's very lucrative for them. That problem continues. It's why we need government oversight. It's that question of sort of who polices the police. It's sort of understandable that we need someone watching the corporations, but your question is why do we need someone watching the government entities watching the corporations? And the answer is the first point you made, which is uh, regulatory capture. I mean, it, it seems to me that one way this could be addressed effectively, um, as well as regulatory capture, is if, if there were laws and statutes and so on that had very stiff penalties and punishment for these types of behavior. But it never, I mean, I mean, so, yes. The, for example, even the whistleblower laws protecting whistleblowers who are actually coming forward to do the job that usually the agencies that they're working for aren't doing, which is why they're standing up and blowing the whistle on some egregious situation. Right. You know, even they really are not that well protected by the whistleblower, well, current whistleblower laws. I mean, the whistleblower laws are basically pieces of paper until someone enforces them. And that means the whistleblower has to pay for a lawyer to help them enforce those laws. Congress doesn't do it for them. The agencies aren't representing whistleblowers themselves. The whistleblowers have to find their own representation, which is a challenge. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing problem. I want you to talk about, um, <clears throat> You had you had uh, you represented the president and vice president of the EPA headquarters, scientists and professionals union, and the National Federation of Federal Employees. Uh, talk about that case because again, um, I think it's it's a really uh, sinister part of regulatory capture. Well, it is and was. Um... Uh, Gap and, and my colleague Richard Condit and I and others at Gap helped um, the president and vice president of the EPA Scientist Union deal with what at that time was a major effort to essentially politicize science. Now that effort hasn't stopped, you may have noticed. <laughs> um, it continues, we've seen it with uh, for years with um, uh, climate change. And you know now, because of the delay created by that propaganda campaign and politicizing science, we now have an emergency situation that's gonna be hard to deal with. Uh, but back in those days, in the early 90s, it was happening in EPA. It had a lot to do with toxics and sort of the environmental threats of the day. Uh, dioxin was one of those, PCBs. Uh, you know, a lot of folks don't realize we have, we had and we still have uh, a, a widespread pattern of poisoning in this country from government, uh, basically corporate capture, allowing corporations to pollute. Climate change is sort of the ultimate adverse impact of this corporate capture thing, because it may destroy the whole planet and all of us. But in the meantime, our children are being poisoned. 
uh, a lot of us are being poisoned. A lot of our cancers and our high cancer rate, which for some reason we've come to take for granted as being natural or inevitable, it's just caused by corporate pollution. And a lot of that evidence was coming out back in those days. And um, Bill Hersey and, and, and Dwight, how was you know, the science politicized? How, like well, explain there, explain how they did that. Well, the the attempt, and I think we stopped it temporarily in those days, was to essentially edit the reports of scientists. And the edits would be done by managers, attorneys, people who weren't scientists, and they would downplay the honest assessments of scientists about the adverse effects of the pollution and make the problem appear not to be a problem. And that's continued uh, to happen. And then you would have, you know, uh, agency reports and press releases that would downplay the problem. Uh, and that then leads to whistleblowers. Well, you know, and you, re you recall, for example, how all of a sudden, finally, they admitted that cigarettes were bad for you. And then the cigarette companies had to pay all this money. And that's another thing that, again, we go back to the accountability and the punishment uh, for these corporations. You know, they, they announced to the public, oh, billions of dollars are going to be paid out. But if you really check the bank accounts <laughs> and the assets and so on of these companies, that's just the cost of doing business a few billion. Yeah, you know? the cigarette, uh, cigarette problem was another example of a corporate propaganda campaign, false science. It had horrible consequences for public health for decades. And the cigarette companies are not out of business. And I don't know that they're struggling financially at the moment. They paid up about, you know, well, still there. I, I don't think they, they have as huge a smoker base here in the U.S. as they um, used to. But, you know, there's China. Right. There are other countries right. where people are still smoking away, you know. Yep. So, but um, I, again, I, I just, this whole landscape is such a despair to me. <laughs> and, and, and people like you, I think, are kind of... Um, unicorns in a way because you know most people when they get into an area when they go to law school it's a lot of work it's a lot of effort you finally and that bar is you know no joke to pass and a lot of people come out in debt and so on i think the last thing they think of is oh or a lot of people don't think oh let me go serve the public to an, to an extent where i can't enrich myself and i'm taught you know constantly fighting these you know, I'm in these David versus Goliath. What is it about you, Nick? Where do you come from? Why do you do this? What well, first, let me you? say I'm not an alien. There have been rumors about that. <laughs> not an alien. I do have a belly button and all that. So, uh, <laughs> no, but the real story is I started out probably the Vietnam War caused me to focus on government corruption. And um, I was a conscientious objector to that war. I was willing to go as a medic, which may not have been a wise decision, but I was willing and uh, almost went. I was one I.O. when they stopped the war. So I uh, missed that barely. I then went to college with the idea of designing systems for making government and educational program schools accountable to citizens because I already perceived a failure in my college days of government accountability. And I actually designed my own undergraduate major focused on government accountability. Really? Uh, yeah, I transferred to University of Chicago from a small college, Franklin College, in order to do that. Uh, University of Chicago decided it wasn't liberal artsy enough to focus on government accountability. So I transferred to Indiana University who let me do it and got my undergraduate degree in that. Um, spent about 10 years, although I was teaching math in high school and some college, junior college. Um, my involvement in education was more as trying to reform the school systems consistent with my government accountability focus. So that's why I actually was a teacher for 10 years. It wasn't because I love math, but it was because I was actually trying to work from the inside of the school systems to reform them. Um, in what way did you want to in reform them? Well, to make a long story short, our school systems have been structured and probably still are to a large extent to 
result in about a 33% failure rate. They're not designed to let every child succeed and every child is capable of succeeding. You know, there are some folks with handicaps and special needs, but, uh, but they can be helped as well. So, but we've sort of been training our citizenry from the early days up, our children, to fit into the corporate structures and the need for a slave labor class to make it blunt. And creating a 33% failure rate helps maintain the inequitable structures in society. And so I wanted to make them more individualized, more accountable, more humane, and more effective so that no matter where you came from as a child, you could succeed. That was my wow. goal. Wow, wow, that's amazing. So now, okay, so in college, you, you were already sort of on this public service um, yeah, focus. Thing. So yeah. let's, before that, in high school, were you awake then too? I began. I, I hate to becoming, use awake or woke. Well, or no, it's, it's, it's true. Were you, I mean, God, I feel, I feel like I was such a slacker because. Well, I didn't want to say anything, Christina, but you know. <laughs> no, I but, wasn't uh, doing anything like that. <laughs> well, you know. It, uh, but I think it was the Vietnam War that I was, you know, my last couple of years of high school would be 70, 71. And, um, you know, it was uh, a disturbing and all the protests and the environmental movement was starting then uh, the pollution was coming to the forefront. So, yeah, I began uh, being awake in the last but were year. Were your classmates like that, too, do you think? Uh, some, a- some. We were fortunate. We had a good uh, teacher in our social studies class and an after school club, if you will, on uh, uh, current events or something like that. I forget what we called it, where we could study, you know, environmental issues and even the war. And that helped us become more awake. I remember writing an essay, I forget what year it was, on uh, patriotism. And I got a a local award. I think it was from the Veterans of Foreign Wars. It might have been the American Legion, but it was, but uh, to their credit, they gave me the award, even though my focus was sometimes it's patriotic to criticize your government when it's actually wrong. And uh, they recognized that. And so I was thinking in those terms in those days. Um, so it wasn't it was an, it was an early uh, adventure for me and it hasn't hasn't stopped. No, it's the same. It's a very consistent path. So there are a couple cases that you dealt with. Um, that sort of foreshadowed your involvement in 9-11 issues. Um, there was one whistleblower uh, that you uh, represented, uh, Dr. Kate Jen- Jenkins. Can you talk about her case? Uh, Dr. Jenkins was a senior scientist at EPA, still is, thanks to our litigation. Uh, she was fired for doing the right thing. Uh, the right thing in this case was disclosing the dangers from the toxic dust from the World Trade Center building collapses on 9-11, which hurt so many first responders. And we've had so many deaths from folks exposed to that dust. I think more people now have died from those after effects of the pollution and the dust and that exposure than actually in the events, tragic events themselves on 9-11. So Dr. Jenkins has been a whistleblower for, I don't know, three decades now in EPA. Uh, and, and exposed to other problems uh, in EPA, including the cover-up of dioxin risk and so forth. Uh, she disclosed this. There was actually a, an email from the Region 2 EPA saying to the headquarters EPA, can't you basically get this person under control or something? I figured wow. that's not, the, that's not wow. the exact wording, but it was to that effect. Um, and so we did litigate uh, for Dr. Jenkins uh, with the public employees for environmental responsibility, which is an offshoot from GAP. And they do a great job of representing environmental whistleblowers. And it took, I think, seven or eight years for but us who to- who at EPA would want to shut her up about that? Well, there's a good question. Uh, we have you know, some of the folks who were signed off on the adverse actions and uh, the person in the second region two that wanted her to be gagged, um, but it goes higher than that. We went pretty high in our in our discovery. You may have noticed in reading that case that EPA tried to, to hide the ball and not give us the documents and discovery that we yes. requested 
and we went through multiple motions to compel. We actually got to the last day of a trial and I was of course examining the decision maker who fired Dr. Jenkins on the stand and discovered in cross-examining her. What was his, what was his name? His name his I, name? Don't, I don't want to give her name. Uh, her name, yes. Her uh, name. Because I'm actually not sure that, you know, her culpability may be very limited. She may be, may have been doing what she was told. It may have been misinformed. Okay. She was acting in sort of figurehead role, I suspect, and making that decision. I don't know if everyone else would agree with me on this case, but that's my view. But um, she did disclose that records existed that we had never been given that were potentially very central to the case about their decision to terminate Dr. Jenkins. So the judge, almost before I objected and said, you know, we haven't been given those documents, the judge was on that problem almost immediately because she had already ordered several times production of documents and and realized EPA wasn't forthcoming. So the, the trial stopped basically instantaneously in midstream. And the judge said to EPA, you know, actually questioned their attorney about documents that hadn't been given. There was some limited admission that there were some documents that hadn't been given. So the judge stopped the trial, ordered EPA to give the documents up. And a year or two later, after several more motions to compel, it turned out there were a couple hundred documents that had never been given to us. And oh at, at the end of that process, um, EPA had lost the case, both on the merits in terms of their having falsely accused Dr. Jenkins of uh, misconduct, which you know was not true. And also they lost because they violated the discovery rules and were dishonest in producing documents and in complying with the orders of the judge. So it's an example of how persistence pays and also how you need to really closely watch your opponent in these cases even if it's the government, because they don't well, always do, do the right thing. I'll tell you, if you're a whistleblower lawyer, lawyer it, it'd be nice if you were immortal because these uh, cases take so long. Because, well, they're, they're, they're not insurmountable though. Yeah, but it's uh, so there's something so galling to me about your own taxpayer dollars being used against you to, uh, to protect a wrongdoer you know, from from being held accountable. That's the I thing. That. I just got so galled about that. And I just wish that oh, it's I wish that it would be more than just, oh, well, OK, we lost the case and the whistleblower won. I wish yeah. it would be we lost the case. And this person who lied and engaged in this stuff is now going to have to go to jail or something. Why does that never happen? Well, you know, you know I I'm can't whining here, but yes, you are. But I, I can't give you the precise answer. Uh, because the people who make those decisions are in the government. But uh, it's, I think it's the corporate capture thing that, you know, uh, you get the slap on the wrist, you have to pay the back pay to the whistleblower, reinstate them, which happened in this case, you have to pay the attorneys. Yeah, but that doesn't come out of their pocket. That comes out of the EPA. The tax, the taxpayer plays, <laughs> the taxpayer pays you're right. all around. There, there they, should be, you're right, there should be sanctions for the government wrongdoers who engaged in the retaliation. They should lose their jobs. They should lose their pensions. You know what, if you want to, if you want to put, you know, okay, poisoning people and because a lot of people died. So in a way, you know, I don't know if you want to call it murder, but, you know, people died because you didn't, you know, you wanted to hide this fact. And so nothing was done about it. So more, there was that toxicity was still around and still, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I do. I'm afraid I do. I mean, most folks remember on the Trade Center issue that the head of EPA actually issued a memo, which downplayed the risk from the air and said it was safe, which was wrong and known to be wrong by EPA at the time. Was that Christy Whitman at that time? Who was it? It might have. It might have been. I don't want to again use names. And I'm sorry if it's not check her. My notes. But I seem it may, to it remember. Been. Uh, but if but it's the not point her, was, I apologize. It was the head of the EPA at the time, and and they knew better or should have known better. Um, someone in EPA knew better, and that um, I mean, what would have happened had they been more forthcoming? Well, at the time, a lot of folks wouldn't have gotten exposed because they would have been wearing respirators or they may not have worked on the site. There would have been fewer deaths. People could have gotten more prompt medical attention because of the known risk. Yeah. I mean, these things have consequences. Oh, I mean, they have they have fatal consequences. And that's the whole thing. <clears throat> you get to hide. You get to hide behind a government agency that pays for your defense. OK, and then the pays for the penalties 
that are that you your activities generate. I mean, the taxpayer just never stops getting um, uh, boinked in this situation. I'm sorry to put it that way. So, well, you know. you're, what you're saying though is is accurate that instead of the the corporations or the government officials who did the retaliation paying out of their pocket or going to jail, basically the taxpayers pay the penalty for the wrongdoers. And that doesn't yeah, there's make any never sense. a human culprit. Well, there could be, and the laws could be changed to make it so. There are, there are a few laws, not many, in that direction. They're not broad enough. You probably are familiar with a couple of them. One of them is one that says if you lie to Congress, you can you know lose your salary. Um, but there aren't many laws like that, um, and we need we need them across the board. And in addition, while we're on this topic, there needs to be a law that says it's a crime to lie to the public. Uh, not just to yes. retaliate. Yes, I agree. I agree. So how did you join the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry? Well, uh, I live in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, I have family in Indiana, even though I did work on the East Coast for a while with Gab. I moved back to help family members. And uh, I was... Um, It's a strange thing. I was walking into a meeting of an environmental group who I was helping on a forest protection issue. And someone said something like there were bombs placed in the buildings. And I said, what are you talking about? And then of course they told me that uh, David Ray Griffin, Dr. David Ray Griffin had made a presentation. I think it was probably at Grand Lake or something in uh, Berkeley, is it? And uh, he had made a case that the World Trade Center buildings had been brought down by explosives. I was shocked to hear that. Uh, I didn't know if it was true. And I said, why, you know, what evidence is there of that? And they said, well, there, there's uh, a chemist who's actually in Bloomington now, who moved to Bloomington, who blew the whistle on some of this, used to work for Underwriters Laboratories. His name is Kevin Ryan. And that you should go talk to Kevin if you want to know about the details. So I did. And, you know, Kevin uh, educated me to my uh, dismay on the scientific evidence of use of explosives. And from that point on, I started making my own inquiries into the matter because it's obviously a huge thing. If those buildings were brought down on 9-11 by explosives, there, then there's a lot more to the story than the official government story. And that means it's another government accountability problem. So, uh, and Kevin was a whistleblower. I assisted him temporarily with a whistleblower claim, which unfortunately in Indiana uh, didn't have a good outcome because Indiana doesn't protect whistleblowers unless you're maybe uh, in a narrow category of workers' compensation. So they don't, they don't have broad whistleblower laws. Uh, but um, Kevin was very helpful. And then he did tell me that there was a budding group of lawyers talking about doing something and investigating, and maybe I should get in touch with them, which led me to contact Jane Clark, who is our most recently was our chair is now treasurer who's been with the organization even before we incorporated it and jane and i talked and i was sort of recruited to the group and shortly thereafter we decided to incorporate and the rest is history as they say so there are two giant petitions <clears throat> that the lawyers committee has has um Sub submitted. Um, talk about the first one and okay. the disposition of that one. Well, that one, to go to the end and work backwards, is now before the second highest court in the country, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. We have oral arguments scheduled for January 21st. Um, that case started with a petition to the U.S. Attorney and to the federal grand jury in the Southern District of New York. And what we did, we accumulated the scientific evidence and the eyewitness evidence of use of explosives at the Trade Center on 9-11. We analyzed it as a group of lawyers and investigators with the help of a number of scientists, engineers, and architects. We actually took testimony on the question publicly in New York uh, around the anniversary on 2016. We researched the law, applied the law to that evidence, and we, we developed uh, a petition which explained all of this for the benefit of a US attorney and a grand jury. And it turned out there were a number of federal crimes that were committed 
on 9-11 because of the use of explosives that had never been prosecuted and apparently never been investigated. And so the goal was to have this evidence placed in the hands of a federal grand jury, have them investigate it, use their own best independent judgment as to whether to whether and how to pursue it. And if the evidence developed as we were convinced it would, to then investigate who done it, the culprits, and try to see if they could get an indictment. Um, we unfortunately learned that the US attorney either has not given our petition to the grand jury, even though it's a duty on the US attorney to do so under federal statute, or has done so, but has refused to tell us. And based on the language the US attorney has filed in federal court, it's about a 95% chance they just haven't done it. And the 5% well, chance- Well, that's another tactic, sit on this forever. Well, they are sitting on it. Uh, it's been, I don't know, three years now. Um, so we sued the US attorney in federal court to force the US attorney to give our petition and the evidence to the grand jury. And in, in the off chance he's already, or she's already done it. It was a he at the time, I think it might be a she now, um, that they should disclose to the court that the grand jury has the petition. We certainly see no sign of that, no sign of investigation. So the district court decided erroneously that we did not have standing, uh, we being the lawyers committee, architects and engineers, some first, uh, if not first responders, uh, ground zero responders, and some family members who lost family members in 9-11, that none of us had standing legal um, eligibility to bring the suit under any of the four claims we brought, which makes no sense if you look at the claims. No, especially since the, the, of that statute says, if you're a citizen and you see a crime, you can take it, uh, you have evidence of a crime, you can take it and have a grand jury look at it, correct? Well, it, it doesn't say it like you said it, but that's what it means. It says that if, if you a citizen give your report of a crime to a U.S. attorney, there is a mandatory obligation on the part of the U.S. attorney to give that to the grand jury. So yes, that is the vehicle these days for citizens to report crimes to grand, federal grand juries. It used to be you could do it directly. Now there's no time limit, is there? I mean, in terms of you should, you know, you have to submit this to a grand jury in a timely fashion, no later than X number, X number of months or years or whatever. There's no, in other um, words, they could sit on it forever? No, uh, there's no date in the statute, but in those cases, law would impose a reasonable time as the requirement on the U.S. attorney to turn the evidence over. We certainly waited more Hasn't than a reasonable, a reasonable time. time elapsed? I would say many times over, yes. Okay, so before we go further with that, I, I want to ask you just to give us some of the details of the some of the major evidence and and witness testimony that you right. have in that petition. Well, I'll give you the, the examples that strike me the most as a lawyer as having maybe the most weight for a judge or a jury. Uh, the one I would start with, uh, Kevin Ryan actually had a role in as a chemist, he and a number of his colleagues uh, took a dust sample from the Trade Center to an independent laboratory and had it analyzed. And that analysis showed the presence of reacted and unreacted nanothermite, uh, which is a high-tech explosive and incendiary, um, which has no place in the Trade Center dust unless you know, explosives and incendiaries were used to bring those buildings down. Is that a military incendiary, military grade? Uh, arguably. And there aren't many people who had access to it in those days, except the military and probably military contractors. There might be one or two exceptions in terms of scientists who did the initial research, but uh, that would be a pretty good guess. Okay. Um, what else? Well, I'm sorry to say that, you know, once you see that sort of evidence of explosive yeah. res residue in the dust, then you start, you know, asking, well, if explosives were used, then you should have seen indications of explosions visually for the witnesses who were there, and you should have heard indications of explosions from the witnesses who were there. So then we discovered that the New York Times had did a Freedom of Information Act to the Fire Department of New York and obtain testimonies of, I don't know how many, more than a hundred firefighters who were eyewitnesses at ground zero on 
and a large number of those firefighters reported sights and sounds of explosions, some very explicit that were not just an explosion that maybe something got set off in the building like a fuel tank or something. And I don't know that that was possible in the towers. It may have been possible in building seven, but there are other problems with building seven. Um, so the- Building seven being the building that was not hit by an airplane, but that went down in, in basically a free fall, which is not natural. Well, part of the, no, yeah. no, building seven, a lot of folks still don't realize that it wasn't just the two towers that fell. Building seven fell later in the day at about 520 had not been hit by an airplane. Hadn't been hit by anything. Well, there was some building damage from I mean, the tower, towers, stuff. Debris, yeah. debris damage. Uh, and there were some fires in it, but it's a steel frame skyscraper. It shouldn't have fallen. And it fell much more uniformly than even the towers, which fell remarkably quickly. And so, in their own footprint. Well, I would say building seven did, and the towers fell more in their footprint than they should have. They had asymmetrical damage. If you watch the videos of the towers, you'll see that the top portions are leaning at some point. And then for some reason, that part doesn't just fall over or fall off or the building doesn't fall to one side. It, it comes down pretty uniformly and straight down. So there's a there are some differences between how the buildings collapse, but the bottom line is they're all consistent with what we call controlled demolition. The towers may be an atypical controlled demolition and building seven more of a typical controlled demolition. So the firefighters testimonies are, you know, struck me because these are professional responders. I'm sorry about the siren in my background here. I don't hear uh, Okay, so. Um, and also didn't some of those witnesses hear explosions before the planes hit? Uh, some witnesses did, not so much the firefighters, but citizen witnesses, some citizens, citizen witnesses did. Uh, Willie Rodriguez uh, in the building maintenance did. He's pretty well known for reporting that and being ignored by the 9-11 commission in that regard. Um, so then in terms of other categories, there were um, analyses of seismic evidence that indicate explosions before the plane hits, ex explosions after the planes hit. And um, so the seismic evidence is corroborative. There are other findings uh, by chemists, for example, these uh, microspheres, which are teeny little balls, spherical metal balls that cannot be formed unless metal is vaporized at extreme temperatures and then cool, and they cool under these spherical forms. They're all over the dust. They're just abundant in the dust. The government admits that. And there's no real scientific explanation except extreme temperatures. Now, people don't realize Jet fuel burns at a certain maximum temperature, so the building contents, you're getting up to maybe 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. But the temperatures required for the spear, spears to be formed and for some of the other metal damage, and actually for some of the measured observed temperatures are much higher, which means something else must have been present to cause those extreme temperatures, which the government is basically ignoring. It's one of those when you start you know, getting back to the and I'm sorry to say there may be some kind of influence here, whether it's corporate capture or some other kind of capture. The government has not done its job on this evidence, still hasn't 20 years later. And, and you have to ask if you've got explosive residue found in the dust, you've got, you know, spheres and other examples, corrosion and well, you also have molten metal, molten which... metal. None of those things can be explained in the absence of explosives and high tech ones that create extreme temperatures. So it's uh, it's one of those Sherlock Holmes things about, in this case, the dog in the nighttime. I don't know if you're a fan of the Sherlock Holmes mysteries, but yes, uh, this is a silver silver blaze story. And and Holmes says something like, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the strange event of the dog in the nighttime. And Watson says the dog didn't, but the dog did nothing in the nighttime. And Holmes says that was the mysterious event because it meant the dog knew. knew the perpetrator right and therefore it didn't right. bark right well in this case you've got a dog in the nighttime thing going on here the government isn't barking okay on this issue they're not investigating it's not prosecuting and why would that be well it might be a similar answer that somebody yeah. in the government might know the perpetrators before we run out of time i i want to move on to the next petition um and and just quickly um, you have had 
experience, previous experience with one of the potential culprits for this next um, um, for this next petition that the uh, lawyers committee submitted, you did a case um, against Dugway, right? Can you that talk is, about true. and uh, t- talk about tell the audience what Dugway is, what the case sure. was, just briefly, so that you can get into, and okay. then just segue into the petition. To the anthrax, yeah. Well, yeah. this is an, an anthrax attacks issue. I had a case actually at the time of 9/11 and the anthrax attacks. I had a case for a whistleblower at Dugway. Uh, Dr. David Hall, who's a chemist. And Dugway is where the uh, army, it's an army chemical and bioweapons testing. It is. It's a, it's uh, a proving, proving grounds for conventional and non-conventional weapons, including right. chemical and biological weapons in Utah. And uh, they've had a few interesting incidents over the years, including a sheep kill, which we won't go into. But um, Dr. Hall was was being forced out of his job because he blew the whistle on mishandling of chemical and biological weapons and agents at Dugway in a number of ways. A couple of quick things. One of the things he disclosed was that the gas mask issued to the troops in the first Gulf War were defective, but the government kept that secret, including from the troops, because they thought it would hurt morale. That was one of the points he disclosed. <laughs> hurt morale, not, yeah. not hurt the soldiers, hurt morale. Oh right. God. And the other thing to lead into the anthrax attacks and the petition that we're talking about is he disclosed that uh, you know anthrax is one of the agents handled at Dugway. He disclosed that Dugway was sending anthrax through the mail and or FedEx around the time of 9-11 and the anthrax attacks. So, and they were sending it to Fort Detrick in Maryland, for example. So uh, that is just a segue into the second petition the Lawyers Committee has done, which is to the US Attorney in Washington, DC, and we also did a petition to Congress on the same evidence. And this regards the 2001 anthrax attacks, which a lot of folks may remember the attacks. A lot of folks don't, but uh, those who remember, it may not have dawned on them that they actually started. The anthrax attacks started only two weeks after 9-11. The 9/11 they were like attacks. a follow-on, right? A follow-on? Well, our, our investigation indicates they were in fact, not just a follow-on in time, but they were appeared to have been intended to achieve the same purpose as the 9-11 attacks and the use of explosives at the Trade Center, which sort of a shock and awe, scare the public into approving the war on terror, the war against Iraq, huge military and intelligence community spending and the reduction in our civil liberties. And that, all those things happened as a result, a combined result of the 9-11 attacks and the anthrax attacks. So um, we did investigate it. And uh, unfortunately, our conclusion was that the, the person that the FBI blamed for those attacks, uh, a scientist at, at Fort Detrick in Maryland, uh, was not responsible and certainly not responsible alone for those attacks. Uh, Dr. Bruce made... Ivins, you're talking about. Yes, I'm, I'm, as you may have noticed, I'm not a name user, but uh, you're welcome to use any name I'm you feel totally appropriate. I'm totally into naming names. Uh, it's, it's up to you. Okay. But Dr. Ivins, in our view, was innocent. Uh, he certainly was being scapegoated. Uh, there was a lot of evidence exonerating him that the evidence did not reveal to the public. Um, keep in mind that Dr. Ivins was like the fifth or sixth suspect down a list that the FBI focused on because they couldn't get their first allegations to stick on the earlier suspects. And they eventually settled on Dr. Ivins, who unfortunately passed away um, and alleged suicide before any indictment came out regarding him. So now, there was never. We should remind our our listeners and viewers that the anthrax attacks included the use of a highly aerosolized anthrax, uh, which was a basically a bioweapon. It was a military grade inhalable act uh, anthrax that was not uh, that that could only have come right from uh, a, a military contractor or a military facility. I mean, it was that um, dangerous. Yeah, it was highly processed. And um, the first allegation by government and media when those attacks happened was that Al Qaeda or Iraq even were responsible. That proved to be false, but is consistent with the point we just made that this was intended to promote the war on terror by falsely accusing those entities Later, the government was forced, I think reluctantly, to acknowledge that 
because of what you just said, Christina, that the anthrax was proven to be highly processed and because of the strain that was used, it had to have come from a US military facility directly or indirectly. And so it basically got Iraq and Al Qaeda off the hook, which is why then the FBI started looking for what they call a lone wolf uh, US suspect rather than looking to perhaps where they should have looked, uh, at least for where the anthrax came from, which was Dugway and, and a prime military contractor, which is what our evidence points to. Um, one of our the conclusions- other, Well, in the yeah. petition, it, the other military contractor is Battelle, correct? Uh, I'll let you use that name. Okay. Uh, you can read the petition, but again, I'm not a name user. Okay. Uh, I use the names in our official filings and not being a lawyer, you wouldn't be as aware, but there are certain uh, privileges for citizens and litigants. When you file an allegation in a civil lawsuit or a criminal petition or a civil petition to a federal government, even if it turns out to be wrong, you're probably not going to be liable for a defamation or something. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to protect my. Well, the petition is publicly available on the lawyers' committee's uh, website. To a certain extent, uh, yes, and there are aspects which are not. Certainly, for the first petition, there was a supplement we haven't talked about, a supplement that went more into naming names on the World Trade Center petition, which we filed uh, essentially under seal, but uh, asking for confidentiality. And I'm just being cautious because, you know, we've done our investigation, but we're not the entity given the power by law to prosecute anyone or to indict or convict. And we're just trying to get the justice system to work as it is intended to do those steps. And no one has done those steps. Well, it's interesting that you say this. We talked about the Department of Justice engaging in corrupt activity. And the interesting thing about uh, the 9-11 investigation is uh, it was completely handed over to the FBI, which is a, a, an arm, you know, the enforce the investigative enforcement arm of the Department of Justice. Okay, it is. and it's it is. very interesting to me that in the World Trade Center, uh, in the World Trade Center situation, you have um, what seems to be high grade explosives that could only come out of a military ordnance situation and then you move into the anthrax thing and here again you have a bioweapon that has to come from a military or military contractor thing is i mean have you thought about that i'm afraid so and it is just as disturbing as you are suggesting that it is which is why a grand jury should look at both of these issues um once you acknowledge the explosives used at the Trade Center and the fact they were high tech, and you also acknowledge, and the government has not acknowledged what I just said for the Trade Center, but they have acknowledged what we just said for the anthrax attacks. They have acknowledged that the anthrax was highly processed, state of the art, US government made uh, bioweapon. And by the way, that bioweapon was used in an attempt in those attacks to assassinate two US senators who happened to be two of the senators delaying passage of the Patriot Act at that time. So the question is for the grand juries and should be for the FBI and the US attorney, uh, is it possible that the high-tech anthrax and the high-tech explosives, both from US sources, apparently, at least directly or indirectly, could have come from the same entity and could that entity be associated with the US government or a military contractor? That question has not been answered. And those perpetrators in both cases remain at large. Well, that gives us all a warm, fuzzy feeling. Yeah, sorry so, about that. So since we've waited so long for a response to the petition um, on the explosives that's in the Southern District Court, and when was when was the um, anthrax petition submitted and to whom was it submitted? It was submitted to the U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia around the anniversary of the 20th anniversary, which was a few months ago, uh, not long ago. The petition to Congress was submitted several months, if not a year before that. Um, so you know, we're going to give the U.S. attorney a little more grace period before we press 
on the District of Columbia U.S. Attorney, and then we probably will press, as we did in New York, to see that something is done there. Uh, and we do hope to work with Congress. I would hope that Congress would become a little more receptive to our petition in light of the, for example, the Capitol insurrection of January 6th, and the fact that we now know that there are people in this country willing to attack the U.S. government from within the country. It's not the first time we have a long history of violence in this country, and if we look at assassinations and so forth, and in most of those cases, the real culprits have never been held to account. So we, we have a, an ongoing pattern. And so what's to keep the perpetrators of the anthrax attacks on Congress from attacking Congress again? What's to keep the folks who put the explosives in the Trade Center from putting explosives well, in, the, in the Capitol building? Especially since they have access to them, apparently. And that access hasn't been cut off because they have not been named or found or held accountable or anything. So, you know, the other thing I'm wondering is, I mean, people are probably sitting here listening to you and going, well, this group, uh, you know, they're really trying to achieve the impossible. Uh, and and it's, it's sort of a third rail issue, all these 9-11 crimes that, that may or may not involve, that probably do not involve uh, the hijackers, you know, their other culprits, it seems. Uh, how do you guys do this? I mean, are you, I don't know, are you being secretly funded by billionaires? <laughs> not yet, not yet. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of doing this on a skeleton crew, a skeleton budget, public interest budget, which is, you know, basically quarter to quarter. We sort of, our survival is sort of quarter to quarter every three months. We don't know if we're going to be available to work on the next three months. We've survived five years that way. And part wow. of that is due, due to commitments from our board members, individual contributions of time and money. And I've committed a lot of my time and actually got, you know, personal loans to survive doing this work which I paid back at my own expense. So we're not well-funded and we should be better funded given the seriousness of this problem that affects all of us and, and folks listening out there are welcome to contribute. But the bottom line is we do what we can when we can, we haven't done as much as we would like. And that's because of the limits of our funding. There are so major what, laws, sorry, go ahead. If, if somebody wanted to contribute to you guys, where do they go? Where's your, what's your website? Uh, it's uh, www.com lcfor911.org, uh, lc for lawyers committee, lc4911.org. And you'll see a very prominent donation button there if you'd like to help us, we'd appreciate it. Um, you know, we're doing what we can. We can't promise we're gonna be there next year at the moment, given our funding, and we'd like to be. So, um, you know, these problems, these crimes aren't old news. Um, you know, the problems with 9-11, particularly since the perpetrators are still out there, uh, are still alive, but it, that level of corruption and lack of accountability, is sort of like the John Dingle thing I started with and the political interference in environmental crimes, these problems haven't been resolved. The, perp the perpetrators haven't been brought to justice, which means they're still free to continue to do their, their corrupt deeds as it benefits them and if you get to the bottom of the 9-11 crimes, you may get to the bottom of the folks who are still perpetrating other crimes today. And um, so, you know, you, at some point, you have to pull on the thread and unravel, you know, the entire ball of yarn and see what's underneath. You've got to turn over the stones and see what crawls out because, you know, we haven't eliminated this risk. This risk is still very real for us even today. Well, I'm going to leave it at that. And I'm going to thank you for your good work and, you know, hope and wish for your success. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.